Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your off-season edition of the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion for Tuesday, April the 2nd, 2019. Uh, you see that Texas flag right there? I am in a hotel room in Houston, Texas, on my way to the National Tropical Weather Conference, which is being held again in South Padre Island. Several of us meeting here in Houston to head down that way starting tomorrow. Uh, we're going to spend, the conference begins Thursday, we're going to get to South Padre tomorrow. We're going to spend today taking a look at some of the flooding um, historical areas that flooded real bad in the Harvey flood from 2017. Actually, that's part uh, real close to where I am now, the Attics Reservoir and the Barker Reservoir uh, on this side of Houston. Uh, sort of a hurricane history lesson, what we're going to do today and tomorrow going to head down towards Corpus Christi later today and on the way stop in and see the areas that Harvey made landfall initially as a Category 4. Some of those places are still, there is still plenty of visible damage. Uh, so kind of a recap with some of the guys that I'm working with about that historic event a couple of years ago almost uh, coming up this August. All right, so let's get rid of me for the time being, at least the image of me. And take a look at what we've got to talk about today. This will be fairly brief. I'm not at my office. I don't have all the tools and so forth available. And I'm in a hotel room and I got to get out of here. So I got to make this kind of quick. All right. Southern Oscillation Index, all negative territory now. I keep talking about that this, if this was the stock market or your stock portfolio or whatever, all the indices would be down for the last 30 days, the last 90 days, and even today. Uh, what does that mean? It means that we are in an El Nino state where the atmosphere and the ocean have uh, conspired or coupled. I guess conspired, a conspiracy means there's willful act. And <laughs> obviously it doesn't work that way, but you get the idea that everything has to come together to generate the El Nino conditions or La Nina or even neutral, whatever the case may be. And in this situation, these negative numbers, especially once you see the numbers go below minus seven, at least according to the Bureau of Meteorology here in Australia, then the atmosphere really is ready to sort of be settled into that El Nino state. And if we look at it on a graphical perspective, yes, there was a fairly decent rise in the 30-day numbers overall, but that has come and met the 90-day index, and everything's pretty much leveled out now at between minus 6 and minus 8. And if you notice, too, on the uh, table here, the last 30 days, going back, almost 30 days, going back to March the 4th, the daily contributor, there was only two times here where we had any positive numbers, and that was here on the 24th and 23rd of March. Um, and so it's been negative pretty much for the entire month of March. And if we go back up to the top just to show you one more time, the uh, month of March ended, uh, of course, at minus 6.8. So we've been uh, negative since January. Pretty de deep drop for February, come up a little bit for March. And that's what I really need to watch from here on out. What does this part of the puzzle tell me and the rest of us that watch this stuff? So if the SOI stays negative, then this El Nino that we're uh, in right now, this El Nino state, can kind of hang on and maybe even try to grow. Uh, but that is not a given, okay, because I see this chart here, the subsurface, and yeah, there's a lot of warm water here at the subsurface, no doubt. But there's really nothing else building back over this way. And I mentioned this last week and probably even the week after that, and We'll just have to, you know, watch this. I'm intrigued by it because, you know, this colder anomaly area is starting to show up uh, at the subsurface here below 150 meters. Uh, while this is really significant, you know, it's already made its way over to the eastern part of the Pacific. And like I said once before, once this gets to the surface, it's like warm butter being spread out across uh, toast or whatever. And it'll keep the Pacific warm. But with no reinforcements coming from this area, I am intrigued to see what does happen because it's only April, okay? And once we get to 
June, July, August, whatever. I mean, skip May because you know this is still going to be pretty prevalent during May. But after that, what's going to happen? And you know, you can look at models and ideas from other people, and I don't know the answer, but I do know that uh, just kind of paying attention to and to it and watching it, which we can do here, this updates about once a week or so. Um, it'll prove to be quite interesting. That's about all I can tell you. It's very intriguing, though, as I see that colder area of subsurface anomaly starting to try to you know, work its way into that equation, so to speak. So we shall see. Uh, looking at the anomalies, what it all looks like at the surface. That was the subsurface. Here we are at the surface. Still a few cold pockets over here in the extreme eastern Pacific in the Nino 1 and 2 region. Uh, it's divided up into four different regions. And then overall, the North Pacific here from the equator north, which would be the North Pacific, of course, is warming. But it's not that substantial yet. And at the same time, look at the Atlantic Basin. Not a cold look like we had this time last year. And next week, I'll go into much more detail on this because we are now less than 60 days from the hurricane season because we will also have a couple of new forecasts uh, on Thursday from Colorado State University, the first um, quantitative forecast from Dr. Phil Klotzbach. My guess is, as he will look at this El Nino stuff and just kind of take the default route and say below average hurricane season, or maybe he'll... Uh, say, you know, slightly uh, below or average, but I don't think he's going to see any signals to suggest an above average hurricane season. That's for the long term overall accumulated cyclone energy. How much something flew into my eye? How much energy these cyclones generate? How many name storms? That's all well and good, but as you know, we are very interested in, for obvious reasons, where what does manage to form ends up. And if that's in your backyard or close to it, even 200 miles away, that can be a big problem and nobody has the answers to where that's going to take place. Something will develop out there. I mean, it's not going to be like 2013, a pretty much dead season. Those are very, very, very rare. So we know that we're going to get some activity. You know, we're going to have these predictions about the whole season. I really like the stuff that's going on from different people. You've heard me talk about them focusing on sub-seasonal forecasting, 30 days out, two weeks out, 10 days out, five days out. That's getting better and better looking at the signals that are coming up rather than focusing on the longer term. I know we'd all love to know in April, will there be a hurricane in my area in August or September? But man, we are just not there yet. Not there. All right, so lower 48 weather real quick. Uh, it's crazy, you know, I leave home, which is Wilmington, North Carolina, right there, and then boom, we finally get one of these nor'easters to develop, uh, and it's going to head out to sea, generally speaking, and, you know, be a big rainmaker, some wet snow, there's already been some wet snow, slushy snowflakes, etc. Kind of late in the season to be getting these massive blizzards, which, you know, maybe up here in Atlantic Canada, uh, especially on the northwest side of it, you could see some fairly blizzard conditions setting in. Um, I mean, I guess it's either blizzard conditions or not, right? <laughs> but it's going to be a pretty strong storm system heading up into that region uh, as it starts to strengthen here off of Cape Fear and then eventually passing by Cape Lookout and Cape Hatteras and not too far from the fourth Cape in today's Cape lineup, Cape Cod. All right, so, you know, if you're out, I don't know who would be, but if you're out at the beach... Uh, you know, watch it because you're going to get sandblasted. Very heavy rainfall in some of those areas, especially the Outer Banks and uh, brisk winds at the coast, and in some cases near hurricane force just offshore. So, you know, just an interesting novelty, uh, kind of late in the year to be having these in terms of a winter impact, but there it is nevertheless. All right, uh, what was my next graphic? Oh, yeah, this is the GFS starting out. Uh, I just did a GIF animation here from Levi's site. Start at the beginning here. This is the next uh, six days. You see the nor'easter head out to sea right there. I say out to sea. I mean, you know how they can either go right up the coast, um, you know, hugging the coast, or just a track off, uh, just offshore. 
and there it goes. You also notice another storm system tries to take shape here towards the end of the week. Again, I am in Houston right here, and I'm going to be making my way down to South Padre, and right towards the uh, middle of the weekend, looks like something tries to set up to bring some heavier rain uh, across the area, maybe, and yeah, we'll see. Um, it was looking a little bit more potent. I was just making sure I had the timestamp right. Uh, the last couple of days now it looks a little bit weaker, which is fine. Don't need any heavy rain in Houston, especially while I'm here trying to get home on Sunday. Uh, we can just pass. The good thing, too, is no severe weather. Just a marginal risk today out here in the west, of course, where it's been so unsettled. And believe it or not, very marginal, very marginal. Again, either marginal or not, right? Uh, up here in the extreme upper Midwest, you know, uh, parts of Wisconsin, eastern Minnesota, and then there's our heavy rain and so forth. No thunderstorms except maybe offshore of the Gulf Stream, but no areas. It's April, and so we're not seeing any big areas of uh, tornado threats coming up. We can look at that here over the next several days. I'm going to focus on this more and more, and a part of it, I've talked about this before as well, Bring me back just for a second. Scoop me out of the way. Wee! <laughs> All right. This is what happens when I get a good night's sleep. I slept probably nine hours. All right. Um, remember, the off-season edition of the discussion here and my overall goal, yes, I like to study the hurricanes, and that's the biggest part uh, of what I am an expert in, especially their impacts. But keeping you aware of other big-ticket weather items, especially those that could harm you, also a part of my job. We're all into this weather stuff as, as a whole. Uh, severe weather can have, you know, life-changing and even life-ending consequences if you're not prepared for it. And April into May is our peak tornado season time period, and I will be focusing on that more and more. That's the first reason. Secondly, I do plan on heading out here to the area in the middle part of Tornado Alley here uh, assuming that we get one of those moderate or high-risk days, probably at the latter part of April or sometime in May, preferably in May for my purposes, well, preferably for you guys, not at all, but, you know, it's probably going to happen. You get these low-pressure areas that come out of the four corners or somewhere out of the Great Basin, uh, the warm, moist air coming up out of the Gulf, and those meet, and you get this area of extreme instability and shear somewhere in this region right in the heart of the alley, and I want to go out there and set up these cameras that we use for hurricanes across the high-risk area and see what we get. I think that could be incredible. Our uh, patron uh, group is helping to fund that on Patreon, and they would be the beneficiaries of it along with the Weather Service. And it's just something I think it's worth an attempt. So that's the other reason that I'm really focused on uh, the tornado season this year. Not going to be chasing any tornadoes. You can forget that. That's a dangerous proposition all around. So setting up those cameras over, I don't know, two, three, four hundred miles, not necessarily to see a tornado, but just to see what happens, to monitor it. You know, like they say, man, I'd like to be a fly on the wall or a camera on a fence post or whatever. We can do that. We have the technology. Sounds like the six million dollar man. We have the technology. Uh, we do. Remember that, Steve Austin? They said we have the technology to fix him or whatever. Well, we do have the technology to monitor severe weather, and we have the technology uh, to watch it as it's happening uh, in a safe manner. All right, off my high horse about all that. Looking ahead to the day three outlook. And uh, when is this? This would be valid, uh, valid, valid, valid Wednesday. Making sure I got it right. Slight risk where? Right there in parts of Tornado Alley. Uh, this may change over time, but this is an indication that it's getting to that time of season, folks. So just start paying attention to that more and more as I will be doing over the coming weeks. That was day two. I'm sorry. This is day three, and that increases to parts of the southern Mississippi Valley and then the day four through eight outlook. Uh, at least I got the, the, day, the, the valid time right by looking at it down there on the graphic. Days four through eight, probability or predictability, whatever, too low, too low, all right? So, you know, just pay attention to that, especially if you're one of our followers out in the Midwest. I want you to be around for when I do get out there and put cameras up. you got to be able to see that, right? All right, 
uh, National Tropical Weather Conference. I am very excited to be a part of this. Alex and Tim, their Herculean efforts, plus the folks assisting them, uh, really put this on as a uh, a premier event, uh, really geared towards broadcast. Uh, but anybody can come to it, uh, weather geeks, uh, all the way up to you know, local TV meteorologists, and you know anybody, honestly. Energy interests, well, there it is. It says it at the top. Broadcast meteorologists, digital media, oil and gas shipping, marine operations, corporations, you name it. Uh, they come to it. And it's nice because there's not 2,000 people there. Um, and, you know, usually it's 100, 120, something like that. And it is an intimate group, and it's awesome. Look at the lineup of speakers uh, from the National Hurricane Center, director Ken Graham, uh, all the way through some of the more familiar faces, myself included, Dr. Klotzbach, uh, Mr. Morgerman, uh, and, and my good friend Greg Carbon. Hadn't seen him in a while. He'll be there. He was in Wilmington for a bit back in my early career days. Jamie Rome from the uh, Storm Surge Unit at the National Hurricane Center and others. So that kicks off Thursday. My presentation is on Friday afternoon. I'll try to get one of our folks to record it. Uh, I think they're going to broadcast these live on Facebook. I will tweet that as they do Hopefully they're successful. Bandwidth down there is sometimes for live stuff, hard to come by. Uh, so I'm going to try to get one of my guys to at least hold up the iPhone and record my session. It's 45 minutes. That's a long time. We'll come up with something. All right. Let me go back to the title card and get out of here. Because soon the maid's going to be knocking at the door. The maid. That's a, I don't like, the housekeeper. Maids are for like the old days, right? You know, the maid's coming. These are the housekeepers. And... They do a great job too, right? Everybody. All right, just trying to compliment. I'm in a good mood today. You have to bear with me. It's a good thing. Rest, uh, relaxation a little bit, and the conference coming up puts me in a good mood. So I'm done. I am Mark Seta. Thanks for tuning in as always. I appreciate it. Uh, I'll be back in the office next week. I fly home on Sunday. Throughout the next few days, I'll be posting a few um, little updates here and there from the conference. Uh, they'll go on our Patreon site first, and then I'll put them out on Twitter or YouTube after that. And uh, it'll be a great week, and we'll see what Dr. Klotzbach says Thursday. Then I think Friday, Tropical Storm Risk, that company, the firm out of the U uh, United Kingdom, UK, they will issue an update, and we'll chew it all over and digest it and see what it all means on next Monday during my update at that point. Have a great rest of your week. I try to hit the button to make me disappear. There we go. Have a great rest of your week. Thanks for watching. I'll talk to you next Monday.